Tell us a story, Ranger Jet. Oh, okay. I could tell you about the time I locked eyes with Sasquatch, or about my brush with the elusive Chupacabra. Then there was that encounter with the Mothman. Yeah, tell us about the Mothman. Of course, I once saw a lake monster and a sea monster on the same day. Wow! That's not even taking all the ghosts, aliens, and UFOs into account. You've seen all that as a park ranger. <laughs> no, son. Those are the creatures I've encountered in my cryptid crate. What's a cryptid crate? Cryptid Crate is a monthly subscription box that arrives on your doorstep each and every month. It's filled with various cryptozoology and paranormal themed items such as t-shirts, hats, art, media, and other collectibles. I want a Cryptid Crate. Yeah, I want one too. You can get yours by visiting www.cryptidcrate.com. Sign up is quick and easy and shipping is always free. I can't wait to get my Cryptid Crate, but for now, how about that story? Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. I have an excellent show lined up for you guys this evening. I have a very special call to share with you toward the end of the show that I think you're really going to enjoy. But before we get started with that, a little reminder that I'm still looking for hometown legend submissions. I've had several submitted over the past few weeks, but just a few more and I can stretch that segment to a two episode series. So, if your town, county, or even state has a strange legend surrounding it, perhaps a monster that's said to lurk the outskirts of town, or maybe a UFO that's crashed into your water tower, either way, I want to hear these stories. So give the hotline a call at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Or hit up the Report Your Sightings tab on the website, which is monstersamonguspodcast.com. It goes without saying that I'm also still accepting any submissions. So, go ahead, send me what you got. Now, as I said at the top of the program, I have an amazing show to share with you guys. So, what do you say we get after it? Our first call of the evening comes to us via Juan in Texas. Hey, Derek. This is Juan. Love the podcast. Uh, I live in El Paso, Texas, a little um, city right next to it called Socorro. It was up in late 90s, I want to say 96, 99. I was, I was still a teen. I was out drinking with a couple of friends. And about maybe half a mile from my, from my mom's house, um, started getting late. I uh, decided to walk back to my mom's house. Uh, while I was walking, well, I want to say it was maybe midnight. I was walking. There's actually a canal that ro- that runs through our neighborhood, and I have to cross that con- that canal. And the little makeshift uh, bridge that we had made since we were younger kids. Uh, anyways, I was going walking back home. I was crossing this little bridge some reason I get the the or the feeling or some weird feeling to look towards my left straight down the canal I saw a little shine of light like maybe a light bulb like if somebody might have been down there with a flashlight fishing or something but uh, at the same time I also heard like a little yell 
not yell, like a little moan type of deal. And the light started getting bigger and bigger, sort of like a like a spotlight type. And the moan and or yell, whatever it was, started getting louder and louder. But this time, I hauled to my mom's house. Got to my mom's house. My mom was up that uh, up. I don't know what the, what the hell she was doing. I guess she might have been drinking, getting a glass of water or something. She um, looks at me. She tells me what what's going on. What's uh, she got scared? And I just let her know. You know what? Um, I explained to her what I saw, and she just responded to me. You know what? Might have been La Llorona or La Muerte. He said, you shouldn't be out at that night, that time of night doing stuff you're not supposed to be doing. And I, I just went to bed and I just, I mean, I just lay there. Eyes wide open, I couldn't sleep. I was just scared. Out of, I was just scared. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's, a, that's my story. It's a little, little quick. Story, you know, I got I got a few more little stories that happened to me. Not not scary like this one, but I'll come back another time. Um, see, um, what you think about that? See, you could offer any type of uh, information, or you might have heard a story like that. I'm on, I'm currently on season three. Um, so let's see if we got um, this will work for you. Hopefully, you could play it. Uh, thank you so much. Love the podcast. Bye-bye. Thank you, Juan. It's incredibly difficult to make an educated guess as to what Juan experienced that night without further description of the light and the moaning sounds. My initial thought was that someone was in the canal with a spotlight and some sort of animal call, but I'm not sure how popular of an activity that practice actually is. Juan does mention La Llorona, a troublesome spirit said to drag unsuspecting victims into the icy depths with her. For more information on La Llorona, hit up episode 20 of season 4. I discussed this entity at length on that particular episode. Now, I suppose it's possible that an animal made its way into the canal and couldn't get back out, causing it to cry out. But that still does not explain the light. So I suppose I'm at a loss for this one. Thank you again, Juan, for taking the time to share it. Our next story does not involve a monster or ghostly apparition. Instead, this call shows us how scary our own minds can be. This is Frequent Submitter Gavin's call from the state of Georgia. Hey, this is uh, Gavin. Um, I live in Atlanta. Um, I've called in a few times with different ghost stories. But um, this one is a little bit different. Um, I wasn't actually planning on calling and telling this story because I don't know if it fits exactly your podcast, but... I heard uh, a girl this week actually say something, uh, tell something familiar or close to it with um, it's like a deja vu story or something like that of her seeing uh, something that happened uh, in her dreams. Um, I don't get anything like that, but throughout my life, I've gotten, I guess you'd call it just t- uh, typical deja vu, except it's a little bit more intense, it feels like for me. Um, and it's repeated over and over again of different times. Mostly it's normally um, pictures of just something that happens and it may not necessarily happen that day, maybe days from then. A lot of times it's so mundane that I just I forget the whatever I saw, but whenever it whenever it happens it just rushes all back like a like I get hit with a brick in the head. Um so it's a lot of times it's just like um hanging out with friends and then all of a sudden a scene will happen just like I've never been to this place before and just bam, it just I it was like I saw this. And other times I'll remember it and I'll recall it. Um, the most extreme time that I ever had, I think, was I was out of town going. Um, I was actually signing up for the Marines at the time. And um, I was on the bus headed out. And we uh, we were going between some hotels to stay the night. Um, this is good. Not, not actually going. Um, we're going to the uh, MEPS where you go to get tested and everything like that. And uh, we're going to hotels, and I've never been to this area before. And I'm just staring outside the window of uh, the bus, 
we come up between three hotels that I've never been to, and I can see it's like a it was like a gif in my head that I saw in this dream, and I could just see myself the bus driving over this hill and seeing the hotels kind of like peak, and it just happens over and over again. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's not fits for this podcast, but that's uh, it just reminded me hearing her story. Um, and I. I thought it was weird, and I don't know if anybody else has these kind of things, but thanks for listening. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, Gavin. Precognition is a funny thing, if it exists at all. There's not much that I can say to either prove or disprove the existence of this highly debated practice, but what I can say is that I've had my own experiences with it that were accurate enough to give me serious pause. I'm sorry I couldn't be more helpful on this one, Gavin but sometimes things happen that are just beyond explanation. So thank you again for the call. Our next call is a creepy one. The following is from another familiar voice. This is Coda's call from California. Hey there again. So I actually thought of another story. This is Coda again in California. Um, This happened years and years ago when I was just a little teenage brat. And essentially what happened is we, me and my friends and everybody, we were done with basically middle school, ready to move on to high school. I got invited to a party so everybody can celebrate and, you know, kind of just let off some steam the next day, and um, it was fun. Went over there, had a good time, lots of people, well, parents and everybody were there. Really, you know, nice, nice party. So as um, time passed, the sun went down. I thought the party was pretty much at an end at that point, but um, it really wasn't. I guess it was just kind of getting started. So the parents were completely open for the kids having a fun night. So what they did is they decided to um, start a hide-and-go-seek thing in the dark, which for me was really fun as a kid. I thought that was kind of a really awesome idea, you know, what uh, better way to you know, play hide-and-go-seek than in the dark and get your journal and rush and somebody scaring you half to death. Um, the other cool thing was that the party was at a friend's house of mine in this little small town called Napomo, and there's just groves and orange trees and everything that you can think of out there. And they had a huge field with just all kinds of lemons and other various, you know, whatever around there. And that was the area. And they're essentially their backyard. And there was a creek uh, with a little river that went right there, right through it. Um, at the time, there was water through it, at least anyway. But um, we all basically gathered around in the middle of the field laid out the, the rules for the game, and then split up into groups and just went and hit. So what we did is um, me, my friend Chris, and the guy who was actually throwing the party, um, and another buddy of mine named Fletcher were all just kind of running towards the outskirts of their property where there's this tree line, um, a barbed wire fence, and... The guy who was throwing the party was telling me, oh, don't worry, nobody lives around there. Nobody lives near us for, you know, at least a mile or so. And I was like, okay, well, no worries then. Um, And again, this was at night. Clear sky, nothing, no wind, no rain, no nothing. Um, We were hiding. And we were in an area where it was really, really dark. Their field every so often had a light here and there, so at least you can kind of see where, you know, you needed to go, if you need to go back to the house, or if you need to go to, like, the shed, or wherever their stuff is. Um, But we were in an area where there was absolutely no light, um, save for, like, this very faint pole that was just a couple yards away that barely shone the light behind us, but not on us. So I was able to see the tree line, and then that was it. You know, obviously you couldn't see in it, there's nothing in there. So we're looking around, trying to be quiet, giggling, being kids, because, you know, we don't want to get caught. And we were thinking, well, let's just scare somebody if they find us. And 
Um, then we'll make a run for it, and then they'll have to, you know, basically try to find this again. So I go along with it. And I said, okay, so I keep an eye out, see who's going to be coming. We don't hear anybody. My buddy Chris taps me on the shoulder, and he's like, what's that? And I look, and I say, what's what? And he's pointing to the tree line. And I don't see anything. I'm just like, I don't see anything at all. Well, what are you talking about exactly? He's all, there's something there in the tree line. So I take a look again, and I'm just like, I don't see anything here or there. And he points at it, and he's all right there. And then I see it. This outline of this figure, this human-shaped figure that's kind of standing there. And it kind of made me panic for a moment, because I was like, whoa, wait, what? the heck is that? There's maybe it's somebody else at the party hiding over there. So we take a few steps closer to kind of see if we can see it a little better, and then it crouches down. And that pretty much scared us immediately, so we tell our other two friends that are with us what's going on. And they kind of ignore us, saying like, oh, you know, whatever, people are coming, we need to basically get ready to scare them, and yada yada. So my friend Chris decides to walk a little closer to whatever it is. And then that's pretty much when the panic ensued. Because the moment that Chris decided to take a couple steps closer because he was really curious about whatever this thing was, it lunged and started running towards us. This thing had a humanoid silhouette. And once the light hit it, it was still black. We, to this day... And I haven't seen these guys in years, because obviously we're grown-ups and moved on and everything, but when I was still talking to them, we brought it up every now and then, but nobody really wanted to talk about it because it scared them that bad. Um, this black thing just started running towards us. First, I panic, then Chris panics. The other two guys that were with us didn't really know what we were panicking about. All we did was tell them, run. And we did. I mean, we ran. We ran so hard that we ran past so many people that were at the party, back to the house, and we told everybody about what happened. Obviously, nobody believed us. They thought it was just somebody else at the party screwing with us, which, I mean, could have happened, but the thing is that some of the dads were saying nobody was out there except us, and they didn't even know we were out there. But, I mean, who's to say that anybody else at the party was? I, I don't know. Now, I'm 35 years old. Years and years down the road, I start learning about all this folklore in the area here. The Charman, the Ojai Vampire, the the foothills with the Shadow People. And Shadow People, I know people see Shadow People here and there, whether it's sleep paralysis or they just think they see a Shadow Person or whatever, but this is kind of an old legend of these Shadow People that live in the foothills and just watch people. And after that incident, it made me think, did we actually stumble upon one of those shadow people? It's really hard to say. This happened a long time ago. And even though I'm 35 and I was probably like 15 or whatever at the time, I can still remember exactly what happened in my head that night. And it was pretty terrifying. But anyway, that's my story. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Coda. I will admit, I do not know a lot about the Shadow Man legends from that area, despite the fact that it's only a short drive from here, and I spend a considerable amount of time there. That is something I need to read up on. The Char Man that he mentioned is particularly interesting. Instead of exploring these legends now, I think I'm going to save them for a future video piece. So, keep your eyes open for that in the future. Now, for my theory on this sighting. The behavior Coda described sounds quite familiar to behavior attributed to Sasquatch. Now, there are a few hang-ups in this theory, which I will get to in a moment, but at first glance, the similarities are difficult to ignore. The creature hid in the tree line and held perfectly still, behavior often reported of Sasquatch. When it was sighted, it simply crouched down, and when it came into the light, it appeared black, given the impression that it might be covered in dark hair or fur. Now, as I alluded to moments ago, this theory is not without its flaws. I've spent a lot of time in the Ojai area, 
And truth be told, it's not terrain that's known to be quote-unquote squatchy. Mostly high desert, scrubland with a few sizable trees, I'd find it difficult that any population of these creatures could remain there undetected for any amount of time. But of course, that does not mean the creature wasn't simply passing through. It should be noted that the BFRO website lists three Sasquatch sightings in Ventura County, most of which go back to the 50s and 60s. Now, of course, this is 100% conjecture. Simple theories based on a few attributes. Either way, the story is a spooky one. I can't imagine seeing something that frightening only to have it then run at you. That's one encounter I think I'd like to pass on. Thank you again, Coda, for the great call. Our next story is a written one. This is an anonymous submission from the Four Corners area. Hello. My story has to do with skinwalkers, or what I believe was a skinwalker. I will remain anonymous for my story. I am originally from Arizona and New Mexico. I am Navajo Native American. This event happened in September of 1993. I grew up in Utah and Arizona and spent my teenage years in New Mexico. I had grown up not hearing any stories of skinwalkers or any type of dark stories from my heritage as a child. My parents weren't really traditional, being brought up in boarding schools for most of their young lives, so these types of unnatural things were not discussed at home. I did not find out about skinwalkers until I was a teenager. I was told stories from some Navajo classmates in high school and by close friends who had encountered these beings. Since I was never told about these types of evil beings, I really didn't believe in them. If anything, I just rationalized it as people with mental issues who thought they were gaining power from going to the proverbial dark side. The thought of them actually having supernatural powers, I wasn't convinced of. So I never really paid much mind to these stories. In 1993, I moved out of Gallup, New Mexico after graduation to attend college. I then lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Albuquerque is not a small town. It is a large city. Not as large as Los Angeles, but it's fairly populated. I lived in a studio apartment right in the middle of the city. One night, I woke up feeling that someone or something was sitting on the bed. I initially thought I was half dreaming and half awake. I kept my eyes closed for a few seconds more but I could tell the presence of someone still sitting there. I also could hear it quietly breathing. I could feel the mattress was sloping down by my feet, so I opened my eyes, more of a blink, but I saw there was something sitting at the right side of the edge of the bed, looking toward the window that was at my right side. What I could see was a figure of a person with long black hair, a lot of hair, and with animal skins on its body. There were areas of bare skin that looked an ashy gray color, like it had been rubbed with ashes from a fireplace. I closed my eyes, telling myself I was still dreaming. Over and over, I am still dreaming. I turned around, rolled over in bed to face the opposite direction, eyes still closed at this point. My boyfriend at the time was there, and I could hear him breathing as he slept. But I could feel the body was close to me. I opened my eyes again, just to see my boyfriend sleeping. I closed my eyes again. Scared at this point that my heart was pounding so loudly and terrified that whatever that thing was, it could hear it. I kept telling myself I was only dreaming. My mind was telling me, no, you are awake. I felt a slight stirring at the edge of the bed that made me scared that it was going to grab me. I felt myself muster up the courage to sit up as fast as I could to look. What I saw made my heart stop. I sat straight up in bed only to see this person or thing run from the kitchen area, across the living room in front of my bed, and through the door. He didn't stop to open it, he just ran through it, like a ghost. From what I could see in the darkness of the room, it was a thin, tall man, almost naked except for some animal skins. Long black hair that mostly covered his face, and skin that seemed to be covered in ashes. He also had a sack or bag of some sort in his hand. It was so fast when he ran by, almost like an animal running but I still remember it clearly. I sat there in bed, awake, still asking myself if this was a dream or did I really see that. I then jumped off the bed and switched on the light which woke up my boyfriend. I must have sounded hysterical and scared. I told him to check the bathroom. I just saw someone run into the room and out the door. He looked dazed, but of course he did it. And, of course, there was nothing there. I opened the front door and looked outside. And again, 
saw nothing. For many years, I told myself it was just a vivid dream. I thought it could be like a night terror, but I was able to move and I felt very awake during this whole episode. I have experienced night terrors before, so I am familiar with how these feel. This was so much different. It was so real. Maybe it was just a ghost that I saw, but what my mind told me was that this was a skinwalker. In the following months of this incident, what seemed like constant bad luck came into my life. My grandfather died, my boyfriend and I went through a very tough time with domestic abuse and my difficult pregnancy. My parents went through a very rough time with the end result of my mother having a severe mental issue. Now of course this could all be coincidence, but remember it all started after this dream slash incident. I chose to remain anonymous because in the Navajo tradition, we are told not to talk about sightings or situations with skinwalkers. This could, in turn, bring more situations with them to come into your life. In the Navajo tradition, these are very evil beings, jealousy being the main driving force of why they do this. You can Google what the initiation requirements are for these people. It's some very scary stuff. Since this has happened, I have embraced my Native American heritage and have more insight on what our traditions are, good and bad. I'm not trying to invite bad things to happen in my life by sharing this story, but I am sharing because I want others to know we've all seen similar things in regards to skinwalkers. I heard a few skinwalker stories on your podcast, but I do not think anyone was Navajo from the Southwest that told the story. So I'm sharing mine with you. Thank you very much for listening to my story. I have a few more about ghosts and UFOs that I will send in the near future. I love the podcast and listen regularly. Keep up the great work and hope to listen to you for many years to come. Thank you for that submission. I realize I'm just as guilty as the next person, but sleep paralysis is blamed quite often for experiences such as this, despite the fact that the experiencer adamantly claims otherwise. It's sort of a catch-all for anything weird that happens when one is asleep. But, I'm beginning to realize that not everything can be explained away using this popular sleep disorder. Now, something the writer mentioned that made me think was the process by which a shaman becomes a skinwalker. The actions are so extreme I felt it necessary to cover them. The following paragraph was taken from NavajoLegends.org. The term Yi Nao Du Shi literally translates to, with it he goes on all fours. According to Navajo legend, a skinwalker is a medicine man or witch who has attained the highest level of priesthood in the tribe, but chose to use his power for evil by taking the form of an animal to inflict pain and suffering on others. To become a skinwalker requires the most evil of deeds, the killing of a close family member. They literally become humans who have acquired immense supernatural power, including the ability to transform into animals and other people. According to the Navajo skinwalker legend, these evil witches are typically seen in the form of a coyote, owl, fox, wolf, or crow, although they do have the ability to turn into any animal that they choose. A link to that full article can be found in the show notes for this evening's show. I certainly can't say definitively what was witnessed that night, but with the description that was given, a skinwalker certainly fits that bill. Thank you again. For sharing that story. Our next call takes us to the state of Kansas for a strange, ghostly story. This is Emily's call. Uh, hi, Derek. My name is Emily. I'm from Wichita, Kansas, and I'm 16 years old. So I want to talk about my sort of lifelong paranormal experience. So when I was younger, we used to live in this small one-story house, and it was just me, my mom, my sister, and my dad, and then our dog. And so well, how it started was when I was in kindergarten, I, you know, we were told to draw a picture of our family. So I drew a house, and I had my mom, my dad, me, my sister, and our dog in it, and then under the house, there was this, I drew this big black mass with a person in it. And when my teacher asked me about it, I said, 
oh, that's my little, that's my brother. He lives in the well under the house. So, of course, my parents got called, and I swear this is important later on to what I think my explanation for it is. So, my dad um, is in, he would get up for work before all of us. This is probably when I was about eight or nine in the same house, and so he's sitting in the kitchen, and from the kitchen table, if you look to your left, you could see into the hallway, and on one side of the hallway, closest to the kitchen, was mine and my sister's bedroom, and on the other in the hallway was their bedroom, where my mom was sleeping. And out of the corner of my eye, out of the corner of his eye, my dad sees um, a little kid, a little blonde kid, walk past the doorway, and he thought it was me, so he goes to make sure that I got tucked into bed because he thought I went to lay with mom. So he goes, he opens the door, I'm not in there. He looks in the living room, I'm not in there, bathroom, not in there, and the computer room, not in there, which are all the rooms that you pass to get to their bedroom. So he goes to see if I was in my bed, and I was. Then, there always has, then I just would always experience small things happening, like things moving, my Barbie dolls would go missing. Um, me and my friends would see someone standing in our tree house, which was probably about 30 feet off of the ground. It was pretty, it was pretty high up in this tree, and to get to that, you had to go through our backyard, which, so we would know if somebody was up there, but we would see somebody standing in our tree house. Then, once I got older and I moved, because I always associated these with that house, then once I got older and my parents got divorced and I got, re and got my mom got remarried, and we moved in with her um, at the time boyfriend and my dad was living in an apartment, things kept happening. It would just be small things like things moving around my room and then I could, would always had that feeling of somebody watching me and that shadow in the, in the corner. Then in 2014, uh, in June, my little brother was born. And then it just escalated all of my experiences. I would see a mass go by, like this orb go by, like right in front of my eyes. And I'd look around, there'd be nobody else there. And um, I would see, sometimes I'd see like little orbs of light and just mist moving around. And then I kind of started to get the thought that this was my brother. Not my newborn little brother, but when my mom found out she was pregnant with me, she found out she was pregnant with twins. And my brother, what I think was, was a boy, that he was too young to tell the um, gender, died. And then fetal absorption happened. So since I was a stronger twin, my body, my body absorbed his fetus. So I started to think that maybe that was it, that maybe my brother was haunting me because he was attached to me because his body was attached to me. And I thought that was maybe a theory. I was like, oh, well, it could just be something attached to me anyways. But that was always just, that's just kind of been my theory of it. But then what really got me thinking that this was it was I have in my bedroom, I have a shelf and I have a picture of my dad and a picture of my little brother. Both of the pictures are the exact same picture frame, the same way, they're setting the same way, so if one falls, you'd think the other would fall. But the picture of my little brother, one day while I was just sitting on my bed, just flew off of that shelf and hit the wall across the room, which was probably, it's about a 10 foot gap. It just flew across the room and hit the wall. And that freaked me out so much. And then once I really went, once I went over to see what picture it was, it was my brother, my baby brother. So I put it back up and multiple times that picture has moved. And then, 
some of my experiences are, a lot of them are small, and it's just kind of like things a brother would do, like he'll, like I'll feel something like messing with my ear, and it won't be my hair touching or anything, it feels like someone's just like pushing on my ear or something, or um, someone's tapping on my shoulder, just small things that I would associate with a sibling doing to annoy you. And then, um, this is what I thought was really significant, is it was probably about 6.50 in the morning, and I was walking over to our front door so I could grab my car keys because I was getting ready to go to school. But I was looking down and watching a video on my phone, and this white mist flies over my phone screen and into my abdomen, like about right under my sternum and went straight out of the body when I turned around and I saw this black mass right behind me and then it just disappeared. So I that freaked me out a lot so I just grabbed my keys and like ran out of the house as quick as I could and left for school. Then later that night my dad told me that my um, grandpa, his dad, had lymphoma and had a small tumor on the outside of his, one of his kidneys. And I didn't put the two together until one of my friends, until I told her about that, those two things, she was like, maybe he was telling you that. Or she made, like, at first she made a joke, like, oh, someone's probably gonna, someone's probably gonna die from, like, stomach pains or something, like, making a joke about it. But then, I actually started, thought, like, maybe he was telling me about that. See, where the mist went through was, like, right about where my kidneys are. So those are my main paranormal experiences with guys associated with my brother. And then this is one more thing that I have always found weird. In our old house, my first house, the one that I drew, like, the picture of um, my brother and the well in, and my dad saw the little boy ghost or the little kid ghost, and me, my dad, and my sister all had the same, like, dream or vision, I don't know what you'd call it, but our hallway was probably 15 feet long, so it was a pretty long hallway, and whenever one of us, we, it'd be dark out, and we always just had this vision that there were wolves passing back and forth, like, with no space in between, they were all packed together and just walking back and forth, and then they would just, we could just walk right through them, which I've always thought was weird, and I didn't know about that until probably a few years ago, and we haven't lived in that house for probably 10 years now. So, those were all my experiences, and thought I'd share them with you and see what you thought about them. Um, I love the podcast. Thank you so much for making it. I'm absolutely addicted to it. And, yeah, I'll probably call back and tell you about some of my other experiences. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Emily. Now, before I move forward, I thought it was important to offer up a little more information about fetal resorption. And I'm probably going to butcher most of these words. Fetal resorption also known as a vanishing twin, is a fetus in a multi-gestation pregnancy which dies in the womb and is then partially or completely reabsorbed. In some instances, the dead twin will be compressed into a flattened parchment-like state known as fetus papyrocerus, I think. Vanishing twins occur in up to one out of every eight multi-fetus pregnancies and may not even be known in most cases. I have never heard of an absorbed twin haunting the other. But in theory, it makes a lot of sense. I just have no anecdotal evidence to back that up. But this story did remind me of another haunting by a young child. A story that also comes out of the state of Kansas. The haunting of the Sally House. The Sally House is located in Atchison, Kansas and is regarded as one of the most haunted places in the United States. Built on an Indian burial ground between 1867 and 1871, the normal looking brick house gives you no evidence of its ghostly reputation. 
but many who have lived there claim that the house contains evil spirits and is haunted by the ghost of a little girl who was later given the name Sally. In the early 90s, the house was brought to national attention when the owners Tony and Deborah Pickman started to have some disturbing paranormal encounters. Tony was even physically attacked, and this was witnessed and documented by the popular television show Sightings. What's most disturbing is that the investigators from the show also endured cuts and burns on their skin while gathering paranormal data from the house. It's called the Sally House because the daughter of some previous tenants had an imaginary friend named Sally, and she is believed to be one of the spirits haunting the house. When Tony Pickman drew a picture of the ghost, the daughter identified it as her friend Sally. Some of the other phenomena experienced by the Pickmans included wall-hung pictures turned upside down, strangely melted candles and burnt finger marks, multiple photo anomalies, Tony had an actual sighting of Sally on Halloween morning 1993. Also, while napping, Tony heard a woman's voice say, here's your remote, as the TV remote control was placed on his chest by unseen hands. That clip comes courtesy of YouTube user Better Mankind. This is a story that was first introduced to me via the 1990s television series Sightings. Watching a ghost scratch a man on camera was a bit traumatizing as a kid. Those images still stick with me today. In fact, I've also linked to that episode in the show notes, so I encourage you all to go have a look when you get a chance. Thank you again, Emily, for taking the time to share this story. It's quite an interesting concept. Alright, I have one more story to share with you guys, one you're really going to enjoy. But first, I have to get through these announcements. Just two short days ago, I lost my grandfather. He'd spent the last year in a nursing facility for sufferers of Alzheimer's and dementia, so his passing was a bit of a blessing for him. For the rest of us, his passing has left a void. A void once consumed by a gruff, stubborn, hard-working family man who was equal parts ornery and loyal. A void that will be impossible to fill. As I've mentioned several times, it was his collection of Time Life and Reader's Digest books based on the paranormal that acted as the kindling that ignited my fascination with the unknown. So in a roundabout way, without him, there would be no monsters among us. So I share all that to let you know that there likely will not be a new episode next week. I'm scheduled to return to Ohio tomorrow to attend his funeral and to celebrate his life with family and friends. I don't return until next Thursday, which will make it pretty difficult to get something out. So I think it's safe to assume that the show will be dark next week. But have no fear, I will be back the following week with your regularly scheduled goodness. Thank you for your patience, and rest in peace, Grandpa. Your influences knew no bounds. Please follow the show on all the social media sites, be a patron supporter for additional content, and rate and review the show. Now I've received two donations this past week, So a huge thank you to Guadalupe R. and Teresa Z. And I feel like I should put a little spotlight on Teresa. Several months ago, I was questioning the future of this program. I hadn't yet set up Patreon, and the show was costing me over 100 bucks a month just to put out. But before I could even decide on the show's fate, Teresa submitted a sizable donation that convinced me to continue for a few more months. This then opened the door for Patreon episodes which in turn eliminated all the issues that were making the show difficult to produce. So, I want to say a special thank you to Teresa. Your multiple donations most likely saved the show. So, thank you. All right, now for that call that I've been teasing all night. The following Mirrored Men story was submitted anonymously from the state of Florida. Hi Derek, I'm a 40-year-old female from Florida. I've been listening to your podcast for a bit now. I've been listening from oldest to most recent. I sure have a lot of catching up to do, but I recently heard the stories about what you've dubbed the mirrored men. To be honest, I was shocked to hear that others have experienced something similar to what I've experienced. My girlfriend and I thoroughly enjoy walking in what little bit of wilderness we have left here in Florida. And once we explored all the little areas near to where we live, 
we began venturing out further from home and sometimes we'd take a tent and sleeping bags so we could just camp. It was the fall of 2014 and we went far enough from home to do just that. This was a place we've explored multiple times so we quickly found a decent spot to set up our tent and leave our gear so that we could explore without carrying any extra weight. After getting that squared away around 1 p.m. we set out walking. We'd been walking for I don't know maybe like 30 minutes when my girlfriend grabbed my arm and began pointing for me to look at something. It was in the distance and it appeared to be falling behind the trees. With this object falling or descending behind trees, I couldn't see many details other than it had an amber glow and appeared to be large and spherical. My immediate thought was that it was a meteor or something of that nature. We decided to walk in that general direction to see if we could find anything at all. After walking for an hour or so, she abruptly stopped right in front of me and I heard her gasp. I looked up to see what appeared to be like three men who looked exactly alike. I'm not sure if you've had calls that describe their attire, but while it was obvious they were dressed in a very dark or black colored outfit, I really couldn't tell what exactly they were wearing. It seemed like it was a one-piece suit with without individual legs being visible, but it, it just didn't flow like a robe. It's hard to explain this since it just wasn't natural. I noticed no fabric moving at all, but I could tell they were taking steps. Neither of us moved at all, and of course they were so close when we noticed them that they obviously knew we were there as well. They moved in unison from west to east across our path until they were directly in front of us. At which point they all turned their heads and looked at us. They were close enough that I could see their faces pretty well, and the best way I can describe them? is completely expressionless and hairless with almost a plastic or fake appearance. When I looked at them, my mind was screaming run, but I couldn't get my legs to work and neither could my girlfriend. I guess we were just frozen from fear or shock. Literally, the next thing I know, my girlfriend is crying and asking me what happened. It was completely dark outside. It was approximately 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon when we encountered these men, and then suddenly it was pitch black. When we finally got back to our tent, which took way too long, then way what too much longer than it should have, all we had was a flashlight. When we finally got back to our tent, which took much longer than it should have with just a flashlight, we grabbed our things and made our way back to the car so we could leave. I did a lot of research after that to try to determine what happened to us and what it was we had seen, but I didn't have any luck. I'd always go back to the idea of extraterrestrial, you know, men in black type beings. We both just tried to push it to the back of our minds and forget it. So you can imagine my shock when I heard that someone experienced something similar. I really hope there are more stories similar to this that I haven't heard yet so that maybe we can try to understand it more. I wouldn't wish seeing those men on anyone, but it's sure nice to know that I am not alone. Thank you so much, caller. This is a first. This is the first time I ever recall a UFO being seen in correlation with the mirrored men. However, all the other telltale signs are there. Identical looks, mirrored behavior, strange clothing, and expressionless faces. But perhaps the biggest attribute is the missing time. In this instance, it seems like the witnesses lost several hours. So, does the presence of a UFO indicate that these beings are not from our planet? Was there a connection between the two anomalies at all? Like mirrored men sightings, this one seems to leave us more puzzled than before we heard it. But, Perhaps more so, it leaves us far more creeped out. Thank you again for sharing this story. It's been a while since we've had one of these encounters submitted, and this one certainly didn't disappoint. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. 
Additional support is provided by Addie Lloyd and Warren Pon Abbott. Any audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Music from this episode was provided by Mayu and Coag Music. Thank you all for listening, and until next week. <laughs>